All right, folks. Uh, everybody who was in the breakout rooms, uh, welcome back to the main room. Uh, let me just tell you about what is going on. Um, we have an author, Greg Lopez. He's written a book called Handbook for New Stoics. So this is about Stoicism. And the interesting thing about this book is that this book is focused on Stoic practice of how do you integrate this Stoic philosophy into your life. So what we're going to do is that we're going to start with an introduction to the book and to Stoicism. So uh, it will be in the interview format. So I'm going to start by asking questions to Greg and we will do that for a few minutes and then we're going to take a one particular Stoic exercise and Greg is going to demonstrate that. Okay, so you don't need to know anything about Stoicism to do that. I mean, that's the power of philosophy. These are the ideas which can speak to each human being. Greg, for people who do not know about Stoicism, who are not familiar with Stoicism, what does Stoicism have to offer to people? Stoicism has to offer a philosophy of life. Uh, so Stoicism is a philosophy of life that was invented during a time where philosophy was a lot more applied than it kind of is today in the universities and academies around maybe the 17, 1800s. It's hard to, it, it was a slow process, but philosophy became less and less about kind of how to live one's life and more specialized and academic, um, especially um, in the English speaking world. So um, but Stoicism comes from a time where, um, called the Hellenistic period, um, about, the, about the time after Alexander the Great died, and that was a time of political turmoil for the Greek world. And a lot of philosophies, um, which were either stemming directly from Socrates or were influenced by Socrates, but in reaction to him, started spouting up. And their goal was to help people try to live better lives. And so Stoicism is one of the philosophies from that tradition that people have carried over into the modern world, or at least attempting to. Why is it that there has been a resurgence of interest in Stoicism in modern times? There seem to be a few um, factors that are converging as far as I can tell. That's a difficult question to answer ultimately. The first one um, is possibly its influence on cognitive behavior therapy. So cognitive behavior therapy is a series of therapies that have shown great promise empirically. The evidence for them is strong in a whole bunch of areas. Um, and stoicism turned out to influence a lot of the forms of cognitive therapies, especially one of the earlier ones called rational emotive behavior therapy, which is still in existence to this day. And you could actually see in practice online right now at the Albert Ellis Institute, which is in New York City. Uh, if you go to the, if you Google for the Albert Ellis Institute and look for um, something called Friday Night Live, you can get tickets and see or have rational emotive behavior therapy done to you, which is a therapy that was heavily, heavily influenced by stoicism. The uh, inventor actually had a uh, his, uh, his uh, clients read Epictetus's Enchiridion 5 first, uh, that it's not things that upset us, but our opinions about things. So from there, the scientific evidence built up for cognitive behavior therapy over the course of a few decades, so much so that it's become quite ingrained in modern culture to some degree, in modern therapeutic culture specifically. So that's one area why stoicism has started to get an emergence um, is because uh, of the rise of cognitive behavior therapy. The second one is that in philosophy, in academic philosophy, there was a dissatisfaction with modern ethical theories like deontology and utilitarianism and stuff. And so there was a resurgence in virtue ethics and virtue ethics takes a very different approach to the, the, the ethics that developed during the modern period. And virtue ethics comes from ancient philosophy. That's kind of the way they viewed things. And so that's a second confluence. And during that time, some people became more interested in philosophy as a way of life. And so in the, probably starting in the 90s with uh, the French scholar Pierre Hadot and a few other academics, people started writing about stoicism as a way to, to help you overcome your personal difficulties in a kind of self-help way and a mix of academic as well. And so that blossomed into the 2000s where, and uh, the 21st century where Stoicism picked up today in modern Stoic form. Uh, just connecting up uh, 
this meetup with the previous meetup, you have worked with Spencer Greenberg uh, and Clearer uh, Thinking on some projects. Can you talk briefly about that? Uh, yes, so I have done a few um, online experiments with Spencer and also written a few essays and interactive web tools uh, for clear thinking. Currently, I'm working on, we're taking a look at um, some meditation techniques and also we're working on how to try to tease apart anxiety, which is still in the early stages in order to try to come up with effective customized interventions. I've also worked on some other things such as what makes people tired in the past and whether we could predict people's tiredness and also overconfidence. Um, what skills, what are there about certain skills that actually make people tend to feel more overconfident? And we've teased a little bit of that apart too. Sometimes we, at Clearer Thinking, we try to actually pursue uh, what's true and what's not. And sometimes getting to the truth is very hard. So sometimes the results, we get some interesting tidbits, but we don't like solve a problem per se. And I'm proud to work with Spencer and Clearer Thinking because he's so focused on the uh like getting to the heart of things getting to the matter of things instead of coming up with an easy answer to hand to people when we haven't actually found one so i really appreciate that and yeah those are some of the things that i've been doing with clear thinking excellent so now talking about your book um why did you write this handbook of a uh, handbook for new stoics and what's the structure of the what are you trying to accomplish with this book uh so we made, Maso and I made the handbook for New Stoics because when, there are a lot of books on Stoicism nowadays, Get, getting to be, I don't know if you could say too many, how do you measure too many, but there are a lot of them out there. But when we surveyed the, what was out there currently, there weren't any that focused on how to actually practice Stoicism and that were solely dedicated to that. There were plenty of books that had practical tips and practical exercises, and you could find practical exercises from other places like Modern Stoicism's Stoicism. Stoic Week, which happens once a year and is happening again this year in late October. If you're interested, you can Google it and check it out. Um, but there was no single resource in order to actually do Stoic practice and moreover to sample the wide range of Stoic practices that seem to exist in the early literature in order to find out what works best for you. So Massimo and I's goal was to put together a kind of smorgasbord of exercises that we dug out from the Stoic literature, sometimes with modifications, sometimes with interpolation, because some of them aren't always crystal clear. And we put it before the reader in order to have them sample different Stoic exercises in order to see what works for them. And after a year of sampling practices, the goal is then to put together your lifelong Stoic curriculum should you choose to. So the goal of Handbook for New Stoics is not to get your official Stoic certificate in the mail and be able to put letters after your last name and put it on your LinkedIn achievements or anything like that. It's more to sample Stoicism and give it an honest go in practice in order to see whether Stoicism is a good fit for you, and if so, what exercises work well for you so that you could put them into practice for the rest of your life, really. Excellent. So what exercise uh, do you have for us today? So the exercise that we're working on today, if you're just joining us for the first time, it's a semi-useful way to come in because we are starting the first exercise of the third section of a handbook for new Stoics. And so I'd like to start off by actually just giving you a brief overview of where we are and the basic curriculum that we're following. So a handbook for new Stoics is structured around the Stoic teacher Epictetus's three-stage um, curriculum of Stoicism, so to speak. So Epictetus was a, a former slave who was uh, eventually freed and became a, one of the most famous Stoic teachers of his era. and um, he may have developed a curriculum that we don't see in other parts of Stoicism. We can't say for sure because so much of the Stoic literature is missing, but this is the first time we really see this kind of three-stage practical curriculum, and it comes from Epictetus. And he had something which the scholar Pierre Hadot calls the three disciplines. And so the book is structured around the three disciplines. And for those of you who've been following along with the rest of us over the course of the past several weeks, we've sampled exercises from the first two out of the three disciplines. So I'd like to take a moment to just refresh people's memories for what those disciplines are. So the first discipline where Stoic students start to train in Epictetus' three-stage model is called by Pierre Hadot, the discipline of desire. And the discipline of desire's goal is to shape your desires and aversions, the things you want to pursue in life and the things that you want to avoid and push back in life in order to make them more focus more on what you can completely control and 
Stoic theory says that what you could completely control at the end of the day is a small section of your mind. You can't control your entire mental life, but you can control a small part of it. And the goal is to reduce your aversions to things that are outside of your control and to reduce your de desires to things that are outside of your control as well. And Epictetus said that this is the first and most important thing to train in. It's where you're going to get the most bang for your buck. And the reason for that is because it reduces a set of kind of toxic, unhelpful emotions that the Stoics called passions. Passions are a subset of what we would call emotions nowadays, but they're not all emotions that, they're not everything that we would call an emotion. So the goal of the discipline of desire is to reduce passions. And the reason for this is not to make you feel better. And this is a common misunderstanding. It's to make you, it's to kind of alleviate mental pain. And that's actually not what the Stoics were going for here. It is a useful side effect of pursuing the discipline of desire, but it is not the main goal. That's the main goal of mental tranquility is a main goal of um, another Hellenistic philosophy, Epicureanism. It is not a goal of, main goal of Stoicism. The goal here is to reduce passions because passions have two problematic components. The first is that, well, actually three, I would say. The first is that the Stoics believe that the, our emotions have propositional or cognitive content, meaning that there, if you take a look at an emotion closely, there are some beliefs that are actually expressed in those emotions about the way the world works. So for instance, if you get angry at somebody, there's a hidden belief in there that that person deserves to punish punishment and I'm going to help get them punished. That's a, a hidden belief that's in the emotion of anger. You don't literally say this to your head, but it is an implicit belief when you get angry. And when you nod and say yes to that initial urge that pops up in your mind, that initial glimmers of anger, then full-blown anger occurs, which is a passion. And so the Stoics want to eliminate passions because these they're based on what, the Stoics think they're based on false value judgments. So you are saying that somebody treating me the wrong way is bad, and therefore I have to punish them, which would be good. And the Stoics say, eh, that's not really what's bad and good in life. What's bad and good in life is something that will always provide you harm if it's bad, or benefit if it's good. Will always getting revenge always benefit you? Probably not. You could take a lot of a lo you could take a look at a lot of literature, a lot of real life scenarios where uh, the want to get revenge often leads uh, one into more trouble than it's worth in the long run. So that's one reason why the Stoics were against passion is that it was based on a false value judgment. The second reason is that the Stoics thought that we were meant to work together as human beings, and that our passions for things get in the way of that. Um, in the like our jealousy can get in the way of friendships if uh your friend turns out to have sexual relations with somebody that you wanted to have sex sex with or um if you know you can be a loving uh daughter son or child um until you know your father leaves you out of the will for some reason that you disagree with and then you hate him all of a sudden we will turn on each other because we desire externals and want to avoid externals and the stoics thought that this was a cruel and unnatural way to live that human beings do well when we cooperate at the end of the day and so getting rid of passions helps us cooperate better that's the second reason why the stoics wanted to get rid of passions the third reason is because they push reason to our side our ability to reason they take over our minds that's one of the defining characteristics of a passion so to speak so uh, passion uh, says, hold on reason, hold my beer, I got this from here. And then it justifies reasons for its existence. So that this is the difference between rationalization and rationality from a stoic point of view. Rationality, you can think out ahead of time about what is really beneficial and what's not, whereas passions make up their own reasons for making you act. They kind of take over things. And so since the passions have these negative consequences of turning us against each other and taking over our minds, the Stoics wanted to get rid of them. It's not because they felt bad. In fact, the Stoics call a lot of things passion that feels good to us, like lust or like righteous anger. Both of those things a lot of people don't want to get rid of. The Stoics would call those passions and want to get rid of them because they take over your mind, they make you anti-rational, and they, turn, they can turn you against other people. So that's the reason why the Stoics wanted to work on that. And so Circling back to the discipline of desire, the first stage of Stoic training and the first third of the book of A Handbook for New Stoics, the goal of the discipline of desire is to temper passions down by focusing on what's in your control and reducing your 
want to have external things turn out the way you want. And this is what a lot of people think of when they think of stoicism overall. Like this is all they think of for stoicism. Like that's stoicism, it's to become resilient, it's to become tough. Well, no, it's not. Um, this only paves the way for the second discipline, which is actually, in my opinion, one of the more, more important ones. It's called the discipline of action. And the discipline of action, once you've tampered down your passions enough and made some progress in the discipline of desire, then you move on to the discipline of action. The discipline of action has two main goals, to act intentionally, to not just act willy-nilly based on circumstance, but to go after what you think is right. And secondly, to act more pro-socially, to try to act with other people's interest in mind in the long run. So once you've tempered passions and not before then, you move on to the discipline of action, which is trying to act intentionally and pro-socially. Then you get to the third discipline, which is what we're going to start tackling today. And I know this is a long introduction, so apologies for that, but I want to get everybody up to speed since we've been two thirds of the way through. And I hope this is a great, good introduction to what we're doing today. But the third discipline is the, called the discipline of ascent. And I'm actually going to read um, Epictetus' own, a translation of Epictetus' own description of the discipline of, of ascent. And it's from Discourses, uh, uh, th book three, section two. Um, so he's, uh, so Epictetus says there that there are three things which a person ought to exercise themselves in. And those are the three disciplines of desire, action, and what we're tackling today, ascent. And he says that the object of the third area, the discipline of ascent, is that we may not be deceived and may not judge at random. And generally, we are concerned with assent. This third discipline is appropriate only for those who are already making progress and is concerned with giving certainty in the very things we have spoken of so that even in sleep or drunkenness or melancholy, no untested impression may come upon us unawares. So there are a couple of things to mention here. So in a sense, you, you're lucky in that you jumped into the first uh, exercise in the discipline of ascent today. So you stopped, you came to a natural point. If this is your first time, you've come here at a natural point to start. But something to emphasize here is that these exercises are meant for people who are advanced students. Epictetus literally says it's appropriate only for those who are already making progress, meaning they've made progress in the first two disciplines. So these exercises are going to be hard, especially if you haven't made progress in the first two disciplines. So I just wanna give you a heads up here that although we're encouraging you to experiment and try these kinds of exercises, more likely than not, you're going to fail and fail often um, unless you've made significant progress. And even then they are not easy. Epictetus himself, the great Stoic teacher said that he'd be happy if he died, not in enlightened Stoic stage, but he, if he was able to die while practicing the third discipline the discipline of ascent. That's how hard it is that Epictetus would say, I'd be happy if I could get to that before I go. Um, so this is hard stuff. And it involves two things. The first thing is that it involves paying attention closely to your present moment judgments and, uh, and constant application to see what your assumptions are and try to catch and counter them. So one of the, the first reason why it's so hard is that it requires a lot of effort to go, you, you don't actually have to sit down and do anything special per se, but you have to constantly pay attention to yourself and your reactions. And that's pretty exhausting and can be hard to do, especially if you haven't done, made much progress in the first two disciplines, which are more intentional. So the first discipline, you know, you would uh, work on your aversion to cold by going out without wearing a jacket or something like that. You do that as an intentional exercise and expose yourself so that you have less aversion over time. The discipline of action, you would sit down and like plan to be helpful to a specific person that day or think about in advance how you could be helpful to somebody. Um, here, you're actually trying to do it on the fly and that is a lot harder. That's the first reason why it's harder. The second reason is because it involves Stoic theory and challenging your assumptions. If you're coming into Stoicism in order to do life hacks to feel better, this is not going, these exercises may not resonate with you because a lot of what's going on presumes that you've already been introduced to some Stoic theory. And so with that, I wanted to pause about for questions and comments about where we are so far before diving into the exercise we're going to tackle today, since that was a lot to cover, but hopefully it was a sufficient recap for you. So I'll hand it over to Srikant in order to let you know how to raise your hand uh, if you're new here and all that jazz. Excellent. So we've got four rules that work very well for us. Number one, keep on topic. Number two, be brief. Number three, 
Feel free to disagree with anything. Speak your mind, but do so courteously. And number four, in order to speak, just go ahead and type an exclamation mark in chat or raise your hand in Zoom. So um, who would like to go first? Questions? I'm going to give, yes, uh, Joe, you first. Um, thanks for the background, actually, uh, Greg. And, and I know I've spoken to you, asked you this in the past, but I just want to reiterate is the idea that um, RDPT had some uh, healthy emotions or passions, so to speak. And whereas stoicism kind of says, as you had mentioned, that the hell with passions. So, uh, you know, it's not not that there none of them are, are good. So I was wondering if you just make that quick distinction for, for because uh, you essentially you talked a little bit about Albert Ellis. Sure. So REBT does make a distinction between unhealthy and healthy negative emotions. So our, that's one of the first differences is REBT is focusing on negative emotions. That's its main deal. Because um, it's a therapy, it's trying to solve problems, and most of the problems people report have to do with negative emotions. Stoicism is not about just negative emotions. It's about a different thing called passions. That's the first uh, difference there. But also, um, so yeah, REBT separates negative emotions into unhealthy and healthy negative emotions. So to give an example, fury would be an unhealthy negative emotion, whereas annoyance would be a healthy negative emotion. How do they judge the difference between the two? Well, an unhealthy negative emotion gets in the way of your long-term goals. So if you get furious and your one of your long-term goals is to stay out of jail because you're not hitting people, then maybe being furious would actually get in the way of those long-term goals. Um, whereas being annoyed actually is healthy um, from an REBT perspective for the main reason that annoyance feels bad. And if you're annoyed, you'll try, it'll kind of drive you to uh, remove the avoid, uh, annoyance from your life, but you could do so without flying off the handle. So healthy negative emotions are actually motivators to push us to do healthy actions, to try to align ourselves with long-term goals. So an REBT therapist would try to identify unhealthy negative emotions and turn them to healthy negative emotions by attacking the underlying beliefs surrounding the emotions in the long run. The Stoics also believed in healthy passions, eupathe. They actually had a word for it. The difference is that the Stoics were pretty, pretty big sticklers about who was able to have these. They said that nobody except the Stoic st sage, the perfectly enlightened Stoic practitioner, could have them. And according to Stoic Stoicism, ancient Stoicism, there either sages were extremely rare. Um, the Stoic uh, philosopher um, and politician Seneca said it was as rare as the phoenix um, rising from the ashes once every 500 years. So they said they're either rare or non-existent, that it was an archetype that didn't actually exist. So essentially, even though the Stoics described healthy, good passions, they, no, real, no person could realistically experience them. Um, so that's another difference between REBT and Stoicism. The Stoic Stoics actually said there were three healthy passions, um, but... Uh, most normal people can experience them. Okay, next question is by Hiro. Uh, he has typed the question, so I'm going to read it out for him. Um, how does one practice improving ascent? Does one focus on a particular something to overcome, say anxiety triggered by a certain occasion, or does one constantly work on ascent at all moments? Um, you constantly work on it as much as you can and what the material for it are quote unquote harsh impressions. And we are actually going to get into that for the exercise today. So we'll spell that out in a few minutes. Thank you. Uh, next up is Leslie followed by Sagar. Leslie, go ahead. Hi, thanks. Um, Greg, I was, I was wondering um, the way you articulated the, the third discipline, the discipline of action, it sounds, oh, sorry, no, sorry, the discipline of ascent. It sounds like it's, it, you said it's to give certainty to the first two the discipline of desire and the discipline of action. But I'm wondering, is it actually adding something new? Discipline of desire, we temper our passions. Discipline of action, we act intentionally and pro-socially. Is discipline three, ascent, actually adding additional pieces, not just internalizing them, but adding a new piece? I would ultimately say no, because according to the Stoic theory, all, um, all emotions would arise from ascent. So you get initial glimmers of emotion, proto-emotions that you can't control. If, uh, if 
Shukant said my book's terrible. I tear up a little bit and I can't help that. Well, actually, I, I don't know if I would or not. But, um, <laughs> so, but I could then, maybe I may even cry a little, but I can say to myself, Shrikant hating on my book doesn't really, you know, it's not ultimately my main value system in life. I want to be a better person. How can I work with this and work with Shrikant to see maybe he has some valid points. And so maybe I could listen to those or, um, or work with that in some other way. So working with impressions is getting to the root of all passions. And so in a sense, you're still working with urges to act and your, uh, th the things that's happened with passions. You're just trying to get more to the root. If it were to add anything, this is where the Epictetan student, Epictetus' students would have focused more on logic and formal logic in order to question their assumptions with rigor. In the handbook for Stoics, New Stoics, we don't really do that. Um, Although that is still a, one of the missing pieces of modern Stoicism, in my view, and I gave a quick talk about that at Stoicon last year. Um, so, um, but I think, yeah, that would be a missing piece. But overall, I'm not sure if it really adds anything new. It's getting more fine-tuned and really ingraining action and desire, the first two disciplines, more at a more fine-grained level. Uh, next up is going to be Sagar, Bruce, and Gretchen. Sagar, go ahead. Oh. Uh, I, I have actually read a book on Stoicism, and uh, and it says that the principles of some of the principles of Stoicism are ethics, logics, and physics. You know, how do you see Stoicism as a part of science? You know, as it includes physics from the the lens of its principle. And the second point is, uh, in the Stoic theory, uh, it, it states that it's completely ideal way of living of life. You know, you know a person has to react positive in any conditions, any situations, that is, in short, he has to be emotionless. Uh, you know, how do we become like that? You know, it's easy. Uh, can you please uh, tell about that? Sure. So um, in terms of science, so uh, science really didn't exist as we know it until uh, way, way after the Stoics. So logic, physics, and ethics are um, all had different meanings than how we did today. So you're correct that the three topics of study, the three topoi of Stoicism, as well as a lot of other Hellenistic philosophies were logic, physics, and ethics. But we have to remember that these are differently termed than how we use them today. So logic literally means stuff that has to, anything that has to do with discourse and includes things like rhetoric, philosophy of language, a tad bit of psychology even. It was a very broad thing, a broad field. And they also then had uh, um, what we would call logic in the modern sense, um, but they would call that dialectic, which was only a subset of logic. So that is part of Stoic training. Ethics, sort of what we mean t today, except ethics literally mean having to do with your character, the ethos. Um, and so ancient ethics was quite different from modern ethics in which um, modern ethics is focused so pretty much solely on outcomes and actions, whereas the grist for the mill of ancient ethics focused more on character. It had concern for actions too, but if you weren't complete, completely painting a complete ethical picture unless you took a person's intent and character into account in virtue ethics. And physics had to do with nature, the world. Phusis literally means nature. And so uh, ancient physics would also include things such as theology, what we consider theology today, and um, as well as what we would consider physics as well in our modern sense. So how we combine these all in a scientific way is open because modern stoicism hasn't existed for all that long. And so um, I would give that as a long-winded answer, answer to avoid the question, which is um, however you'd want to make it, um, because it's not, the book ain't written yet. Um, so, because new science didn't exist in ancient Stoic times. So I personally would want to, I, one of the things that attracted me to Stoicism was even the ancient em emphasis on rationality. If there was a philosophy of life that said, throw a rationality away, I would throw that philosophy of life away because how would I be able to judge its efficacy without a clear mind and clear tools for thinking? So Stoicism's emphasis on rationality is what helped me got into it. But I think a modern Stoic, if, something rubbed up against modern science that was well supported, not in a kind of hand wavy science way, but if you really could see that there was a strong clash and the evidence was on the scientific theory side, I'd say believe the scientific theory, don't believe stoicism. To answer your, uh, the second part of your question, how to become emotionalist, um, you have to convince a doctor to perform a lobotomy on you, even if you don't necessarily need it, and they could take out the parts of your brain, because that's not what stoicism is about. It is about reducing passions. Passions, as I said before, are a subset of emotions that are unhealthy and harmful from a Stoic perspective. So um, Stoicism becoming emotionalist, that is simply not what Stoicism is. 
Uh, next up is going to be Bruce. Uh, he asked me to read the question for him. Have you considered older antecedents to Stoic philosophy? Uh, we see that CBT comes from the ancients, in particular from Stoic training, but why not consider that Stoic wisdom came from farther east where Buddhism trained practitioners to monitor their reactions through what's known today as Vipassana meditation? What is the connection between Stoicism and that? Nobody knows for sure. There are just some hints. We know that one of the ancient... Um, Hellenistic philosophers, Pyrrho actually accompanied Alexander the Great when he invaded India and probably encountered ascetics. We have reports that there were um, in, there were some interactions between what um, what are, were probably Buddhist monks, although we're not 100% sure, and um, Alexander's uh, retinue and the current occupation there. Um, Pyrrho then came back and founded one of the several schools of Hellenistic philosophy, which we call skepticism nowadays, and it's called Pyrrhonian skepticism after Pyrrho, because there are other kinds of skepticism. Out of all of the Hellenistic philosophies, um, that is the most likely to have some relationship to Buddhism, but it's quite different. Um, there are also some interesting glimmers of possible interaction and cultural exchange. One is the idea that reincarnation and rebirth kind of sort of suddenly sort of suddenly pops up in the Greek world um, around the time where proto-Hinduism and Buddhism, Jainism and all that kind of stuff was flourishing in India. So there is a chance that there may have been some influence, but there are no clear lines of evidence that show definite influence and exchange in a strong sense. So it, so one of the practices of Stoicism and the Dissonal Ascent is to temper your beliefs to the evidence. And um, I would say like there is some very light evidence that there may have been some exchange and influence, but it's not really a lot to go on. So I would not go around saying Buddhism uh, definitely influenced Stoicism because we have very few lines of evidence that really indicate that well. So we take one more question and then we will proceed. Uh, the last question is from Mike S. Mike, go ahead. Yeah, from what I recall, uh, caution, wish, and joy were the positive passions. And uh, I do recall that in the past I've had caution for doing uh, bad things, wished for some positive action, and taken some joy in uh, good outcomes. Um, and I'm not a sage. So does modern stoicism differ on the positive uh passions and also like you i've been uh, uh experienced in buddhism and they have like the heart practice or brahma viharas to to develop uh positive emotions of like uh, loving kindness joy equanimity and compassion so isn't that another counter example of how you can develop positive passions? Um, it may or may not be, except this, one of the defining characteristics of a good passion and one of the defining characteristics of a bad passion in Stoicism is, is constancy or lack thereof. So there is a book which is baffling. If you don't understand Stoic theory, the title may be baffling, but it's by Seneca. It's called On the Constancy of the Sage. And he's describing how the sage is constant. Uh, uh, what's that mean? That he like takes a poop once a day in the morning and it's nice and firm? Uh, what does a constant sage do? What is that? What is going on there? But what he's actually describing is this is one of the characteristics of a good passion is that it could never be swayed. And so you can perhaps have some positive feelings on occasion, but can any event take that away from you? If so, then it's not a constant and therefore doesn't qualify as a good passion. Um, so one of the defining characteristics of what the Stoics are pointing to when they say only the sage can have good passions is that they're constant about it. Can anybody stop you from ca genuinely caring about another good person if they, uh, and I'm just kind of doing the general you, <laughs> definitely not you in particular, Mike. I, I have no idea about, at all. Um, you could be a sage for all I know. Um, but um, the, 
But if somebody can stop a person with an external from care, doing the right thing, from caring, from any of that, they're not constant. Externals can stop you from doing the right thing. Then you're not a sage and therefore you can't experience these positive emotions because some external thing can take it away from you. And Seneca actually lays out um, three stages of stoic progress. I think it's in letter 72, if I remember correctly, but don't quote me on that. Um, and one of the stages of progress is you're almost a sage, but if something came and poked you, you'd lose your cool. And this is actually, a, um, talking about Buddhism, I've also practiced Buddhism and have been on meditation retreats and there's so many reports of somebody getting all blissed out and peaceful minded on retreat. And then they drive home from the meditation retreat, some guy cuts them off and all of a sudden they're like, that, that bastard, blah, blah, blah. And so that's the example of non-constancy. Buddhism is very aware of non-constancy. One of the fundamental marks of existence is anatta. Um, so, um, both Buddhism and Stoicism are well aware of these, but you have to be careful about what you're pointing to when you say good passion, because the Stoics are pointing to a very specific thing, this constant thing that no external event could ever take away from you. So yeah, you could feel joy as we would call it joy. You wouldn't feel joy as what the Stoics call it joy. So often when conversing about things, there's actually going back to Spencer's earlier stuff and rationalism in general, the modern movement of rationalism, there's this great thing called uh, rationalist taboo where if you're get, getting a disagreement about things, it's often due to language. And so you agree, if you're talking to somebody in, with good intentions, they actually want to work something out instead of win the argument, which is what most arguments seems to be nowadays. But if you actually want to work out something with somebody, you agree to taboo the word, to not use it and instead find other words or perhaps use subscript. So you could feel joy, subscript, modern, for instance, and nobody would argue with that. Even a Stoic would not argue with that. An ancient Stoic, you could bring up, dig up Chrysippus from the grave and you'd say, yeah, you feel joy subscript modern, but you don't feel joy subscript Stoic. Um, so it's a difference in what you're pointing to. And we saw this also in the last question about the Stoics being emotionless. You gotta be careful about what you're pointing to and make sure that everybody's pointing to the same thing because words are slippery. So be careful there. Right. Um, so, Greg, shall we go to the next uh, level? I think we've, we've had, people have had a good chance to ask questions. Go ahead. Okay. So, I think it is practice time. So, um, I'm going to read the quote. So, for those of you who are following along from the book, we're going to be working with week 36 and the exercise from there, which is titled, Catch and Apply the Dichotomy of Control to Initial Impressions. This is the first exercise that we give in the Discipline of Ascent section of the book. So, I'm going to start by reading off the quote on which the exercise is based, then giving you an idea of how to try to apply this for the week, opening it up for questions. You'll do some work in some breakout rooms, then we'll get back together and share our final thoughts. So that's the curriculum for the rest of today. So I'll start by reading the, the translation of the quote that is in week 36 that inspires this exercise. And it's a pretty famous one that people who are even moderately uh, familiar with Stoicism would know. So. This is Epictetus speaking in Enchiridion, uh, or the handbook. Um, make it your study, then, to confront every harsh impression with the words. You are but an impression and not at all what you seem to be. Then test it by those rules that you possess. And first, by this, the chief test of all. Is it concerned with what is in our power or what is not in our power? And if it is concerned with what is not in our power, be ready to answer that it is nothing to you. So there's a lot to unpack here. So I'm going to spend a few minutes just unpacking it, going kind of almost line by line. So Epictetus is starting off the very first part of his handbook, which is actually not written by Epictetus. It was written by one of his students, Arian. That's where we get all of our information. We get the discourses and the handbook, the two writings of Epictetus or teachings. They're actually written by his student Arian, who is also a major source for the information we have on Alexander the Great. Um, and it's um, Arian was a student of Epictetus. And so this handbook, we don't know for certain how it was used, but you have to kind of think um, about who was writing this and what was being written for. So Arian went to Epictetus's school and kind of graduated. He got his fill of Epictetus' teaching before moving on with his life. And so he wrote this short version to himself in order to read and remind himself of stuff that's already there. So a lot of people go to Epictetus' handbook, his Enchiridion, as an introduction to Stoicism. I wouldn't recommend that um, because I like in the Enchiridion um, to, uh, I, the Enchiridion is kind of to the 
discourses, the other writings of Arian, as cocaine is to cocoa leaves. Like cocaine is the <laughs> strong purified stuff that's in very sharp form and could be dangerous if you overdose on it. Or if you want a less illicit version, uh, aspirin to willow bark. Um, so, um, and the Enchiridion is boiled down pure stuff. And if you go in there and don't know anything about stoicism and start reading this, it's going to sound possibly like crazy talk, which, you know, arguably it is, it isn't. But I think that somebody who knows nothing about stoicism coming into this isn't quite in the position to judge whether it's crazy talk or yet, not quite yet. But also it's very easy to misunderstand. I still am possibly misunderstanding things from the anchority and it's not an easy thing to untangle. So um, going in here, it, um, and that's another reason why this is kind of the discipline of ascent is like for advanced. It presumes that you already kind of buy into some aspects of stoicism and may not work if you, it probably won't work if you don't really buy into it. So let's go back to the quote and go through how it um, rolls out practically. So he's, he, so Arian is kind of telling, saying, telling himself through Epictetus's words at the very beginning of his handbook saying, make it your study to confront every harsh impression with some words. Let's stop there because this is going to be the grist of the mill for this week's practice. Your work is going to be working with harsh impressions. A harsh impression is just the initial glimmers of some kind of strong emotion or passion. So you're not gonna be working with every impression you get throughout the day. You're not going to sit there and say, am I really looking at Zoom right now? Cause you're getting the impression that you're sitting at a Zoom conference right now. Okay, you don't need to work with that unless you feel very powerfully about being on Zoom or not being on Zoom, then you would work with it. So you're gonna be working with harsh impressions. They can be negatively tinted, but they can also be positively tinted. If you see somebody on the street who you find physically attractive and you start turning your head, that's still a harsh impression because it is a powerful glimmers of the beginning of emotion. So harsh impressions are things that are not under your control. You can't really do anything to guarantee we'll never get harsh impressions. They are instead the grist of the mill for stoic practice in the discipline of ascent. Um, for those of you, it sounds like some of you are familiar with Buddhism. A lot of Buddhist teachers often say that when you're meditating, the fact that your mind wandered off is actually grist for the mill to build your attention. It's like, ah, I noticed it. Now I can bring it back and be actually thankful that your mind wandered. A Stoic would find harsh impressions, the glimmerings of the beginning of a hard emotion, to be thankful for that and say, this is grist of the mill for me to practice the discipline of ascent. So that's what you're working with. Harsh impressions are not in your control. Um, don't blame yourself for them. Even like initial thoughts and stuff like that, like that asshole or thinking, thinking something that you would normally feel ashamed of. If it's a quick automatic thought, it's really not in your control. It's something to work with, but it's not you per se. So keep that in mind and actually be a little grateful for it if you can, because that's grist for the military for your practice for the week. So you're going to say to every harsh impression, the words, you're but an impression and not at all what you seem to be. So you're actually going to talk back to your impression. You're going to talk to yourself in your head quickly. That's the second part. Epictetus here is literally saying to talk to yourself, maybe not out loud, but in your head. And you're kind of talking to the initial impression and you're trying to gain distance by taking it as something other than yourself. You're talking to it as if it's another entity. You are but an impression. You are not what you appear to be. And in the Greek, this is actually a lot shorter. This is kind of a big mouthful in English. Um, and so one of the things that I'm going to ask you to do, possibly in your breakout rooms, is to come up with a more succinct, catchy thing that works for you that you could say to an impression. So you get a harsh impression, you notice that it's there, and you say to it, hold up, you may not be right, or something like that. Okay, so those are the first few steps. We're already at three steps, and this is all within like a second or two. So we see how hard the split of ascent is. Now you have another thing to do. And Epictetus says, then test it, test the impression by those rules that you possess. Going to pause here. Those rules that you possess, well, if you're a new person to Stoicism and just picked up a book and started reading it, what rules? I, I'm here to learn about Stoicism. This is for advanced students who already know and buy into basic Stoic principles. And what Epictetus is asking his advanced students to do is to test the impression to see if it holds according to Stoic theory that they've worked out in a classroom beforehand and buy into, because they've gone through the logic, they've turned it over left and right, and they actually buy into it. They say cognitively, Stoicism and its theories make sense. If you haven't done this, it's, this may not be the right exercise for you, at least as Epictetus spells it out. Although another thing you could do is kind of twist it and fix, fit it to your, twist it in a good way and fit it to your own beliefs and your own use cases in order to see whether you could make it, uh, it work for you. So 
just to recall the steps. Get a harsh impression. You notice the, which is not under your control. You notice the impression that's under your control, or at least you practice in it. You say to it, hold up for a second. Wait a minute. Then you try to test it by the, some stoic principles. And he gives you the main stoic principle that is probably the easiest and most famous to work with. Um, Epictetus says, and first of all, by this principle, the chief test of all, is it concerned with what is in our power or with what is not within our power? So this is applying the dichotomy of control or sometimes called the stoic fork. Um, so you hold, the, you hold the impression away. You say, hold up, you may not be right. Is this thing that I'm getting the glimmers of emotion about, is it in my control? complete control, or is it not under my complete control? If it's not under your complete, if it's under your complete control, cool, you're done. If it is not under your complete control, you do a final step, which is you, uh, um, you are ready with the answer that it is nothing to you. Um, so you, again, talk to the impression. I think actually in the Greek, it is quote, it seems to be quoted here. So you say, that's nothing to me. Um, and, um, so that's what you're kind of saying at the end of the day. So just to go over the steps one more time, you notice the impression, you, you get a harsh impression, which is not under your control. It just happens to everybody. You say, hold up impression. Um, let, me see, let me see what you're about. And then you, te you uh, test it by whether it's in your control if it's not. If it's not under your complete control, if what you're getting starting to get emotional about is not under your complete control, say it's nothing to you or some other phrase that you come up with in advance. You kind of put it to your side by talking to yourself in a way that convinces you to let go of it and not give it much more mind. That phrase, it is nothing to you, as, as some self-promotion, um, is actually drenched in a lot of meaning and Stoic theory that I think is missed by a lot of people. And my talk at Stoicon 2020 is going to be actually, it's entitled, it is nothing to, that's nothing to me, a reappraisal. And I'm actually going to go into the details of what this means, because it's very easy to interpret this as saying, meh, whatever, um, which, you know, is kind of useful for a lot of people in stoicism when they're working with kind of everyday upsets. Um, you know, if you're trying to be a resilient entrepreneur and you lose a lot of money, you could say, meh, you know, it's nothing to me. I can, I can move on. If you are trying to beat your personal record at the gym and you, you didn't make it, you can say, okay, that's, that's not under my complete control. I'm going to move on. But as you start saying it's nothing to you to more and more things, it starts to become sounding less like philosophy and more like psychopathy. You could say, you know, oh, my mother died. It's nothing to me. Oh, my child's on their deathbed. It's nothing to me. Um, that starts to sound crazy. And like I said before, a lot of Stoicism and the Encardian can sound crazy. And that's because it's not what Epictetus is actually saying. And you have to kind of know what he's getting at. And my talk about Stoicon 2020 is going to be unpacking it is nothing to me because it assumes a very important theory of selfhood that is present in stoicism at least in my feet my thesis is that that a lot of people just don't talk about and it, it would behoove them to discuss and know about a little bit more so that is the exercise for the week your goal is to catch impressions hold them off for a bit test them as think of them as hypotheses not fact so you know if you get angry you could start to say hold off Maybe I'm not right in this anger. Why am I angry? And then if, or um, am I angry because somebody else is acting in a way I don't like? Well, that's not, a, not under my control. It's nothing to me. I put it to the side. Or if you say, if you're shopping for a new shiny piece of electronics or you watch some YouTube channels on tech gadgets and you start saying, oh boy, I wish I could have that new folding phone or whatever, um, then you, know, you could say, hold up, that's a harsh impression. Is, is this going to make my life better? Is it under my complete control to get the phone and keep it? No, it is nothing to me. And so you're going to do this over and over again this week in the moment. Um, and if you have trouble catching stuff, you may not even want to focus on all that ladder stuff. What could be a useful kind of set of training wheels is to get a clicker and just notice when you get a harsh impression and don't even bother working with it. Just say, hey, I noted impression. I noted impression. If you get a harsh impression to go buy the folding phone, um, well, I, please, don't, please don't get yourself into debt or anything. But you know, if you, if you have a harsh impression, if you get annoyed, if you get angry, if you have desires, at least click, like, click it. There are a lot of good apps where you could download and just kind of keep a tally for the day and see how many harsh impressions you catch. And that could be your first part of your week's exercise. Um, and also, 
Um, but if you want to work further, then you could hold it away, take it as a hypothesis, see what it's underlying, uh, see whether it's in your control or not, and then say it's nothing to you if it's not under your control. So that is the exercise for the week. And I'm going to stop and take questions about this exercise at this point, um, and then give you a couple of discussion questions to try to work out the mechanics of this for the week for yourself in the chat, in the uh, breakout rooms. Okay, uh, next up is going to be Leslie followed by Danilo. Okay, great. I, I, I've been listening to you and contemplating the question I asked before, and I, I just wanted to, this isn't exactly a question about the exercise, but it, um, so tell me if it's too off track. It seems that the book says value judgments and impressions, and this, this is from our chapter, value judgments and impressions lead to emotions and the emotions lead to action. So it seems like the three disciplines in that cause and effect chain, the first step is this third discipline of ascent and that, and that maybe what we are adding in this third discipline is choosing whether or not to assent to those value judgments and impressions that lead to the first discipline of emotion and the second discipline of action. Yep, that is, that is how they are tied in, although that's kind of, if you practice them right, that's kind of implicitly what you're doing. You're just doing it in a slower, more methodical, intentional way in the first two disciplines. So the discipline of action, you know, let's take the typical prototypical broicism example of taking a cold shower or whatever. If you go into a cold shower, if you're going to say, I'm practicing the discipline of desire by going into a cold shower and toughening out, and then you're like, oh, this sucks, this sucks. Am I done yet? Am I done yet? Uh, whew, thank goodness it's over. If you did that, you are not practicing the discipline of desire because you're not working with your thoughts. You are supposed to go, kind of go into the situation and kind of work with your impression. So you're kind of right, but you're kind of doing it intentionally. You're exposing yourself intentionally to work with them, kind of like going to the gym. So the first two exercises, the first two disciplines are kind of like going to the gym. You go in and intentionally train yourself to do certain things and get yourself roughly on the right track. Then this is kind of like performing well at the event. When stuff comes up in your life, then you work with it. So in a sense, yeah, they're, they have a lot of overlap and a lot in common. It's just the way you're going about practicing is going to be very different. If you go back and look at a lot of the exercises in the first two sections of the book, they're like, sit down, plan out an exercise to do during the day, expose yourself to a hardship, think of a kind thing that you could do in order to um, benefit the people around you and go and do it. It's you sitting down and sitting out to do something intentionally ahead of time. This is working with stuff that's happening in the moment. And that's one of the biggest differences, but definitely they're related and definitely desires, aversions and actions all come from ascent at the end of the day. I'm definitely not denying that. It's just, you're working not as close, not as close to ascent in the previous two disciplines as you are here. Here, you're trying to get right to the root of it. There, you're kind of, you're kind of, you're kind of pulling up the leaves of the weeds in the first two disciplines. And here, you're trying to dig it out from the root. Um, Epictetus doesn't say it outright, but it is, he comes very close to saying like, this is, I, I actually may say it close enough to outright, he, um, that this is the path to sagehood. If you complete the discipline of ascent, you are sage, you're done. <laughs> you could, they could throw the book away, you're, you're all, you're all set. Um, but um, until then, well, so that's the path to sagehood, but until then it takes like the first two disciplines really digging to get the basics and kind of carve the rut in the positive rut in order to uh, uh, move your cart forward. Uh, next up is Danilo, Dante, and Bruce. Uh, Danilo, go ahead. Yes, Greg. Uh, and what if I came up to the conclusion that it, it is on my control? What, what should the reaction be? Um, name something that's under your control. For example, I'm regretful. I call someone pain. Okay, it's causing pain, so people, causing another person pain in your complete control. Well, I have control to at least apologize. Okay, um, not answering the question. Is it under your complete control whether you cause somebody pain or not? Not complete. Okay, well, then it's nothing to you. <laughs> That's the entire exercise for the week. Um, that doesn't mean that you're not going to, you could, if, some, if you get the impression that you want to apologize, that is under complete control. Then you could go and act on it. So I asked you that before answering your question because uh, it's really important to get those first two weeks um, in the handbook down, really knowing what's under your complete control. And if it's not under your complete control, if you don't have, maybe not, 
maybe like 99% control. I'll, I'll allow that. Like, because apologizing, I guess, isn't under complete control. What if they move away? Um, what if they have a heart attack while you're walking to apologize to them? Then you couldn't. Those are very low probability events, so you could let it go. But your intent to want to make it up somehow to them, that is under your control. So it's really your intent that's under your complete control, not even apologizing to them, the intention to apologize. But you can let it slip and say, okay, my apology to them would be under complete control. But always, like, if you're not comfortable with what's under your complete control or not, um, sections one and two, weeks one and two of the book are going to be kind of tackling that. And if you don't feel secure in that, this exercise isn't for you. So uh, I appreciate you bringing this up because it's hard if you if it's hard to if it's hard for you to know what's under your complete control or not it may be worth it to instead tweak this exercise to instead catch the impression and work more on paper after the fact about what's under your complete control or not because a lot of people have trouble with that because it's i understandably because it's really hard to do it's and it's counterintuitive the stoic perspective on it again the enchiridion and the discipline of scent really rely on the fact that you do understand stoicism to a decent degree before diving into it uh, thank you. Last question is from Bruce. He says, uh, so many examples of impressions not under our control. Uh, a few of different kind, please, of things which are in our control. But what, what impressions are within our control? Uh, I want to help that person. So the urge to help the person, whether I can or not, is not under my control whether I actually then wind up, yeah, whether I can do some, whether I'm in the position to do something to help or not is not under my control. But the intention to try and to honestly take other people's well-being into account during your actions, that's under your control. Um, your want to, um, your want to uh, not be as obsessive about some desire, whatever that desire may be, sex, money, fame, praise, whatever it is. The want to do that is under your complete control. That's what you're aiming for. That's a desire. That's one of the guide points in your ship of life. That's what you're steering for. You could say, I'm going to aim to reduce my desires for external things. Whether you always succeed in that and whether you can actually remember that, not under your complete control. So things like, so essentially Epictetus gives the list of the four things in life that are under your complete control. They are desires, aversions, impulses to act, not actions, impulses to act, and ascent. Desires are your guideposts in life, what you're aiming to get. Aversions are things you're aiming to avoid. The, and those you could set out in advance. You could say, yeah, my goal in life is to try to do X, Y, and Z. You, uh, your goal in life could be anything you want. You could set your desire to become a, super rich. Um, but Stoicism would say that's probably going to lead to a lot of problems because it's outside of your control. And so you're going to fail to get your desire a lot of the time and you'll be miserable. Instead, you want to focus on desiring to desire things better. Um, so it's a little bit meta there. You also, your impulses to act, your intentions to act are under your complete control. Your actions and their consequences are not under your complete control. Your intent to act always is. And your assent, whether you agree to with your initial impressions about things or whether you don't, whether I get the impulse to say, I want to help out here, I could assent to that. I could say, yeah, I do want to help out. And then I'm going to start helping out. Or I could say, nah, I'm not going to help out. I want to watch TV instead, in which case then I'm going to go and watch TV. So that, that assent guides my actions. It also guides my passions. If I assent to saying that some, if I say wealth is great and I'm not making enough money, I'm going to be miserable. I'm going to be in a passion of despair because I'm not getting what I want and what I want is not under my complete control. So the, there are only four things that are under your complete control. They're all small subsets of your mind, not your entire mind. They are your desires and aversions what you're aiming for in life, um, not whether you get it, what you're aiming for, your impulses to act, what you want to do, not what you do, what you want to do, and your assent, whether you say yes or no to your initial urges to act and your initial value judgments, not those initial impulses to act or value judgments themselves. Those are not under your control. If you get an urge to um, say something mean to somebody, that's not your fault because that's not really you. It's whether you say, yeah, I should do that or no, I shouldn't is what is up to you. And that's what you work with in Stoicism. Excellent, Greg. So do you want, uh, how about uh, you give the final instructions for uh, the exercise in the breakout room? All right. So for the breakout room, there are a couple of things to do. The first is uh, remembering you're working in the moment with harsh impressions as they come up. 
So what you're going to talk about in the breakout room is, first of all, how the hell can you remember to do that? You're, and remember, you're going to fail probably a lot of the time. But what can you do to maximize your chances of remembering to do this throughout the week? That's question number one. Question number two, these kind of old timey words about saying you are but an impression and you are not at all what you appear to be. And then saying it is nothing to be. Those may not resonate with you. So come up with your own phrases that may resonate with you more in the breakout rooms uh, by working together and exchanging ideas about what you could do to hold the impression off a little bit and what you can do to put the quest impression to the side. So those are the three things you want to do in the breakout rooms. How do you remember to do this in the first place and catch impressions? How do you talk to the impression to put it at a distance and question it? And how do you actually put it to the side using what words would you use to do that? So that's what you're, that's the mission for the breakout room. Excellent. So I'm starting the breakout rooms now. They will be for 20 minutes and then we'll automatically come back here to share our takeaways. All right, starting the breakout rooms now. 